Okay, so uh, we had a look at the video of the secant piles, and that is meta statements on page 219. It starts, and just to give you guys a bit of an overview of what uh, meta statements is, do you guys know what it is? No. In short. No. In basically, in short, a method statement is a, a method, it's basically just saying this is how we're going to do that. It's, a, it's your planning uh, of your sequencing just on paper. Okay. So you, it's a, like an execution plan. Uh, not that where you're going to execute someone, but how you're going to execute um, the work on site. Okay, so it has many forms um, and it's an essential part of the planning process. Uh, you, you use it at tender stage, uh, construction stage, and also you've got safe uh, safety method statements, uh, which uh, these days within your um, health and safety file is a big requirement, um, is to actually have the correct uh, safety methods. We'll talk about safety methods later on, um, how to apply it, whether you have separate safety um, method statements or to combine your normal safety uh, method statements with your normal um, method statements. Okay, it's an, a written explanation of the proposed method of construction relating to specific site operations, building elements or stages of work. It may be in a tubular or written form and include uh, details of hazards. I personally like the tubular forms um, but that it's totally up to you. It's a preference thing of um, actually writing it out uh, or putting it into a table and having it in, in a point manner. Your scheduling, your program is also so, um, a method of capturing me the method of execution. So um, usually that runs hand in hand. Your program and your method statements go uh, complement each other. Uh, it may form part of a risk assessment process and safety measures uh, and it may be included uh, like safety nets and so on that you need to think of uh, when working at heights. The program re relation may also be included. Tubular forms may be easier and simpler but may have some restrictions so you might not be able to include, uh, include as much information in that uh, when you use tubular uh, method statements. Okay, let's try again. So your method statement should not be too long or overly complex. Um, it should be communicated well in advance. And the purpose of a method statement, as I said, uh, is to um, statements at various stages um, should be understood. Uh, for instance, now the examples that I've gone through for your um, pre-tender stage uh, method statements uh, it doesn't help going into it too mu in too much detail uh, because you don't have the time and money to go into it in too much detail and because you also don't have all the information yet. Um, maybe the, con the client or the con um, engineer will come back and say but you have to use a concrete or you can't use a concrete pump you need to reverse your trucks in and go out again so uh, that's the stuff that you need to consider. Okay, then it conveys different meanings to different stakeholders. It is a common practice to combine a safety method statement with the general method statement. Okay, so you can see it can be combined. Instead of having your normal separate method statement on the one hand, you can have, and then your safety method statement on the other, uh, you can combine the two. What I usually see from the contractors is they have their method statement, and then they just have like an addendum to that, which is the safety one. Um, uh, referring to each stage and just say how they're going to mitigate the risk that they've got on it. Okay, then uh, looking at specific examples, um, this is now on page 219 on the first page. Is specific operations is like, for instance, your excavation works to foundations, your demolitions, laying precast concrete floor units. Then you've got your stages of work, 
and you've got your groundwork to damp proof, brickwork to first floor, brickwork to eaves, site drainage and manholes. So this is a bit more like a gang chart or your program type of um, uh, method statements. And then we're, uh, we're based on elements. You, you can have your substructure work, superstructure, external envelope. Uh, you can structure your method statements in, in any of these um, three um, ways, um, but it's just to keep a logical flow of it. Um, what the guys usually do, uh, what I've seen and what, I've, what I usually ask for is on your program, uh, do your method statements in accordance to your program. So for instance, your excavations uh, or your site clearance, Start with your site clearance, that method statements first, and your excavations first, and so on. Okay. Okay, then this is very important. As you know, by this time, I like to use the diagrams uh, because it has a whole lot of information on it, and it makes it, it's just logical to think about it. So, looking at your tender method statements, this is now the examples that we've gone through, is it, it aids the estimator to make an estimate. It enables the bid to be based on practical methods and um, to assess alternative proposals at the tender stage, assess the plant requirements for inclusion in the tender, um, to, be, to provide a basis for the tender estimator. So this is very important, why you use method statements. Bernard, you asked, I think, why uh, the method statements are used or when. Uh, so this is basically why we have, have it. Then we've got construction work method statements. Okay, this is obvious. It's to explain the, con uh, the proposed methods and sequence of work, checking by the client, client's representative. Basically, for instance, now the, uh, the engineer needs to know how you're actually going to pour this uh, concrete. For instance, Amelia, where we did uh, the pour, there it was a 24 hour pour so he wanted we had to have contingencies for instance if the concrete stopped where are we going to stop um, the concrete uh, cobble joints because it has a big influence if you stop you can't stop at certain points in your uh, in a slab like that because the structural integrity is compromised of a slab like that if you've got if you've got a a joint uh, or cold joint that's a certain say, a place so for instance if you you want to have that over your columns uh, a cold joint so that if there's a joint and there's movement that it's on sort of both sides of the slabs you can see there's two different slabs actually supported by the uh, the column underneath so that's the type of rationale that you need to think of when you're preparing a, a method statement uh, it calculates the duration of the program, uh, an assistant to side a gang of people that you need to assign your resources and to plan activities in detail so that logical construction sequence is adopted. I think it's fairly straightforward and um, it provides an, easy, uh, an easily understood document which can be communicated to those who will carry out the work. Okay, so that's the other thing that we haven't spoken about is actually conveying the method of construction to your team on site. When you've got your uh, toolbox talk uh, and you need to convey that information to your team and to your managers, you can actually have that method statement that you can give to your um, site or your foreman uh, for men and or uh, explain it in the toolbox talk. Okay, so you've got a uh, document that you can work from. Okay, then the safety method statements that we're going to look at is to demonstrate the uh, safe method operations to be included in the construction health and safety plan, uh, etc. You guys can go through that. Um, just another one is to show personal protective equipment requirements and so forth. Okay, so I think that's fairly straightforward. Okay, then preparation of the method statements done by the contractors or cons um, by contractors and subcontractors um, at various stages. Sorry for the spelling I see. 
I had quite a bit of spelling errors uh, and the constructors. This is the contractor. Um, yeah, it's almost there. It's not really right, but it's uh, you guys get the idea. Okay, no standard form exists. Um, there's no standard form for method statements, although some con um, contractors do actually have a standard form that they use, um, which is also very nice. Um, it may be subject to personal interpretation. The goal, however, is to have the job thought through and safe. Some clients require method statements. Okay, I usually require method statements. So I write it in my contract that I need method statements on how you're actually going to fit uh, material. Okay, then you've got pre-tender method statements. Okay, so they embroidered on that. So we've looked at it. Um, the pre-tender program and your method statements go hand in hand. Major elements are highlighted and perhaps major items are highlighted further. Okay, the estimator may consider different methods and cost alternatives. You remember that example that we had about the pump or actually um, bringing in your um, tippers or your concrete trucks. Then the contractor's general approach without no detail. So, uh, you need um, basically you need to have the necessary details to do the calculations. And then you've got your civil projects are more reliant on method statements. This is um, some f a bonus that I just added, which is not in, in the book. You will find in your standard system uh, type of measurement, uh, you have a, a whole lot of detail in your drawings and your buildings. So there's a whole lot of, lot of information on it. Whereas in your civil drawings, you may have a drawing of a building and the contractor has to, it's, it's measured as one item, that a pump house, for instance. So the contractor will have to write a whole method statement to enable him to actually price it. Whereas in the standard system, we measure it out. We've got the strip foundation. The QS actually does the method statement for the contractor, okay, in a sense. Okay. So just take note of it, um, that there is a difference between buildings and civil work. Okay, and it has an influence on the tender price, the plant selection, and the materials. Okay, the influence on, um, on price at tender stage is sometimes the contractor wants to spread most of his methods, um, most of his risk um, to the subcontractors through the method statement. So, um, that's something that he, one can do with a method or think about through a method statement. With tender submissions, it is usually difficult um, because at uh, your subcontractors <coughs> at tender stage don't usually give the main contractor a method statement. Uh, maybe your electrical engineer might do something like that, or your mechanical engineer um, might assist with that, um, but there's usually not enough time to actually do that. Okay, then this is the example that we went through while the power was off. So we discussed um, different methods. That is also, like I said, five meters. Um, <coughs> so we've done that. I look at the different um, types of method statements. So you can either have one method or alternative method and then you com can compare the pros and the cons for your costs. Um, and you guys can go through the examples. Okay, then the decision, tender decision on plant. Plant is an expensive commodity and you need to consider certain items like the nature of the site, the sur surrounding buildings, site access, working space, overhead power lines, and other services. Then you have your crane radiuses um, that you need to consider, for instance, as well. We'll do that now in the next example. We'll have a look at it. Okay, so here we get to our next example, which is on page 223. You will find where it happens. So basically, you've got two um, sites. Um, you will see figure 11.2 and 11.3 shows us the one option. And then on page 226, th 
we've got a second option so I just first wanted to put this slide on for you so the first option looks at a crane uh, set up like this two cranes um, normal standard cranes fixed cranes uh, and the second one looks at a um, mobile crane uh, option um, that one might use so okay just the page uh, or just to put the drawing on for you so example two proposal one you've got um, a proposal of having one fixed crane on this side and another fixed crane on that side uh, the one with a 25 radio, meter radius and the other one with a uh, 30 meter radius and they actually overlap with with it with each other so you've got fixed crane so you will use this first crane say up to a point um, you will see it's not in the basement the basement is that dotted line going around there so you will have uh, at one stage we close we've done everything around the crane and then you need to take down that crane and then fill that section up later on okay so you will have a bit of a um, once you're out of the ground uh, you can actually take that one out or get rid of that one and only leave the one so you guys can read through that I think it's very straightforward um, and it just gives you the two options uh, I think there's another diagram here which proposal one uh, this is now once the the basement is actually done uh, so that's the one option um, why this one they have the two cranes is for access you can see the access is limited uh, to this crane here because it, it goes it doesn't necessarily reach everywhere so that's the cons some of uh, one of the considerations that you need to take into account is access to site and to where the crane can actually go okay so but just go read through it I think it's fairly straightforward um, Let me just have a look here. Tower crane one will be located outside the basement area between the two staircase towers. The 20 meter jib radius will uh, cover all lifting operations for the staircase lip, uh, slip form construction and will also partly service the construction of the eight story concrete frames. Tower crane two is to be located in the basement area and is, uh, is to have a jib radius of 30 meters. The crane is to be erected as soon as excavation works are complete and is intended to provide all lifting operations within the basement area. Okay. Rebar, formwork, etc. All major uh, concrete pours to floor slabs and walls will be undertaken by static concrete pumps and smaller pours with concrete cranes and skips. So you can see that is more or less what they've got for their method statements at tender stage. Okay, are you guys comfortable with that? So it's just a method statement. This is how they thought about it. Um, the 20 meter radius reach is not uh, really necessary. There's something which I can also, uh, which I don't say here that one should um, also consider is regulations, um, is how far a crane can actually reach over a public road and into someone else's um, uh, um, site so that's something that one needs to consider as well okay so the second example that they've got is a um, well the second proposal um, figure 11.4 the basement material handling operations are to be undertaken using two low pivot jib uh, mobile cranes so this is more like so how a mobile crane looks with a, a movable jib, we can actually we actually blow a whole section of the crane and bring it up again instead of just lowering one arm and bringing it up and moving it around. Here, the whole structure actually moves and the whole jib moves down, picks up the thing, and 
Um, it's almost like a mobile crane that you bring in and take out. Yeah. So this is the scenario. And what they've got here is they've got one crane on this side, one crane on this side, one on that side, one on that side. And you've got a, a crane path. So they move from the one side to the other side, from that side to that side. These, these little sections here where they can't uh, where they don't have access, but they use a mobile crane crane to service these these areas. Okay. So then you need to go and do the calculation of how much it costs to actually have um, get these mobile cranes in for uh, temporary um, site operations. Obviously, your mobile jib uh, movable jib um, cranes are cheaper than your fixed cranes. So that's the considerations that you want to do. Okay, so you will see up to this point it's fairly cryptic. It just says this is more or less what we're going to look at uh, or not. Okay, so you guys understand that type of method statement. Okay, now we get to construction method statements. The main goal is to explain how the proposed work will be executed in light of the master program. Uh, the use of this method statement is activity durations, resource requirements, plan activity details, uh, easily understand, understood documents that can be communicated to others. If required, discipline and logical and goes hand in hand with plant and labor relationships. Okay, then the um, subcontractors attendance requirements should also be considered. Output of the gangs uh, should also be considered. So that's the sequ sequencing that comes into play. Okay, in brickwork items in the BOQ, there's extra over for face brickwork. In your method statements, items like facing, laying of damp proof in windows and building lintels should also be considered. Uh, all those items should be reflected in your output. Okay, then your activity durations. This is important uh, for me. Um, it will assist you guys in explaining what um, your activity durations is, but it's fairly straightforward. It's your quantity of brickwork in square meters and your output of the gang per hour uh, and eight hours per day. So you get is it's basically getting to a square meter rate per hour. Okay. Alternatively, the quantity of bricks can be divided out of the gang in bricks per day. This may be straightforward but difficult to judge and depends on the gang makeup, the type of work, location of work, the requirements, standards. So basically in short what they're saying is you can either calculate your output, say for instance this gang can produce a thousand, a thousand bricks per day or they can produce X amount of square meters per day. You guys understand that. The one just relates easier to the BOQ, where the other one is more to your material and labor. So you have to do your material and labor one because that's the most accurate one, but then you can take it further to actually your square meter per day. Okay. Okay, then they've got this uh, example on uh, figure of 11.5. So you guys can see in that little blocky on page 229 how a typical method statement for construction looks. So you can see this is much more detail that they've got in here than they've got in your pre or in your tender uh, method statements. Okay. So where in your tender method statements you had two lines, you have a two pages for one item. Okay, so if you have a look at this example, um, it's again, it looks similar to that um, example that we had earlier on. Uh, I think they just looked at it a little bit uh, more in detail and they only have one tower crane now instead of the two tower cranes. But, and they've got an excavation of um, of five meters again. Um, so let's just go through um, that method statement. 
The excavation works in association with removal of spoil to reduce the ground to the required level, allowing construction work to basement piling and floor to commence. Construction work includes pile caps and bases within the basement area. The basement excavation is to take place between the secant uh, pile wall. Access to the 5 meter deep basement is via proposed access road. So here's the access road that they've got planned. Um, and then uh, pedestrian, there will be a pedestrian access to, to be via scaffolding access towers. The volume of the excavation material is approximately 9,800 uh, 9, squares. And then the program duration for the works is 20 or 4 weeks or 20 days. Okay, so then they can calculate, okay, I need X amount of uh, trucks. Uh, coming in so you will see that on page 230 where they actually do the calculation of machine output is 25 loads per day that they have to take out Okay So I'm also not going to go through um, the method statement in detail, but you will see You've got your description of the works at the top That's the one that we just started and if you've got your sequence where they prior to excavation works taking place, the following procedures must be carried out. And then you list your um, detail, um, details of how to go about. Then you've got a second section, your resources, your supervision, your labor, your plant. You list all those items that you need to uh, sequence here. And then they combine their health and safety within this um, meta statement. So you can see significant hazards. And then you've got control measures, uh, so there's the health and safety section incorporated, and then they've got their PPE there at the bottom. Okay, I think it's fairly straightforward. Questions? Mm -hmm. to so, go through that. Uh, that's the one example. And then they've got the second example, it's just the concrete pour itself. Uh, yeah, they just show how they're going to do sequence of the construction main floor area. So they've progressed up to the ground floor, and then they just show how they're actually going to pour their ground floor uh, from the one side going to the other side, and then the permanent access to the um, basement via this section. So it's fairly straightforward. I like to do it in tubular form with sketches and drawings because it's just more logical uh, and you can get much more information within the drawing than actually uh, ex trying to explain it on a piece of paper. Okay, then they just went into more details of actually construction bays. So um, they've got certain blocks that they do their pours because you can't pour a continuous block Remember that site visit to Sarge where we had the ex uh, construction joints and the saw cut joints for the expansion of your or movement of your concrete? Uh, that's basically why you have to plan boxing in your concrete pores within the specified um, perimeters from the co uh, contract or oh, engineer. Okay. Okay, then just lastly, safety method statements, although not. Uh, required by law, it may be required by the health and safety specification and normally is. It's dependent on the client's health and safety representative, whether you're actually going to include health and safety method statements. Um, we always include that uh, with the new construction regulations. It is law to actually have methods, health and safety uh, method statements compiled. Okay. And that's my story. Mm.